Ah, yes. The mahar discussion. Women think it represents their worth and men think they're being rinsed of all their money. This is how you should be thinking about mahar. Assalamu alaikum, this is Amin and I wrote the book on Islamic masculinity over there. So mahar, obviously it's the money that a husband pays to his wife. It, he gives it, he gifts it to his wife when they are going to get married. And it's something that must be done for Muslims to have a valid, proper marriage. It's also called the dowry, of course. And I think the big problem of mahar in today's society is that people and society are doing two things wrong. Number one, they think that their daughter's mahar represents her worth. It becomes a keeping up with the Joneses activity where people want to know other people's mahar and they want to make sure it's at a certain level because my daughter is worth more than X's daughter. The other thing is that men are not being open, honest, transparent about what they can and cannot reasonably afford. You see, mahar in reality is just a detail. It's just a formality of getting married. And a lot of unmarried brothers, they really like this subject and they really think it's a very big deal. The main thing though is that the girl you're going to marry is the right girl. That's the decision that's going to make or break your life a lot of the time. So make sure you get that right. And for the right girl, it's completely okay to overpay in mahar. And for the wrong girl, it's not even worth discussing it with her or her family. Like really, think about it. Think about it here with me. If you got married, you have an amazing wife now. She's really good. She's everything she seemed to be. You made a great decision. You've got a house. You've got your kids. Everything's going great. Would you regret paying 30% more than what you thought was reasonable for the mahar. No. And if you paid $5, five pound mahar, but the girl turned out to be a nightmare, she ruined your life, divorced you, took your kids away. Would you say to yourself, oh, it's fine because I didn't pay much mahar anyway for her? No, you would never say that. So focus on the main thing. Keep the main thing, the main thing, which is getting married to the right girl in the first place. And later on, I'll talk about how much mahar I gave to get married and how you can make sure that you pay a reasonable amount. But just keep this in mind first. The other perspective is that the mahar is a gift. This means you can expect reward from Allah for giving it. Remove your ego right now of she got this amount out of me and turn it into expecting a reward for every single penny that you gave. And actually, I've just realized, I think in this video, I've been using the word paid mahar, but really it should be give the mahar because you don't pay a gift. You give a gift and mahar is a gift. It's an obligatory gift, but it is a gift. That's the spirit of it. And really this approach, this attitude to giving to your wife is going to really be helpful for you in married life because you're going to be spending on things that you think are ridiculous when it comes to your wife. She will want certain things that you think are completely illogical. And the only way you can justify buying it for her is because you're thinking, okay, look, this is ridiculous, but I'm expecting reward from Allah. That's the only way to do it without feeling feeling deep resentment. And in the video I did about the traits that good Muslim women are looking for in a husband, one of them was generosity. So this is a place where you can kind of flex that muscle and get used to being generous. And of course, flexing your trust in Allah that I'm giving this amount and I expect I'm going to get it back in the form of rewards and in the form of risk. And of course, we remember the Prophet ﷺ said, charity does not decrease from your wealth. So spend in that way. Now, having said all of that, your future wife and her family need to be reasonable. Now, I won't reveal the exact number, but I gave about 20% of my savings to my wife as the mahar when I got married. So if I had 10,000 pounds saved, I gave 2,000 pounds. And I would consider that very reasonable. Even if they asked for £4,000, for example, I would have considered that pretty reasonable, especially since we're talking about UK standards here. And for the right girl, yes, I would have given 40% of my savings. But what if what they ask for is not reasonable for someone on a normal salary in the UK or in the country that you're in? Sometimes all it takes for things to shift is a man who is direct and confident to turn up and say the right things. There are two things to keep in mind when trying to work out if what they're asking for for Mahar is reasonable or not. Number one, what is the norm in your country and social class? And number two, what you can actually physically afford. And it works like this. As long as you can afford it, you should give at least what the norm is for your country and social class. 
Don't give any less than that unless they're asking for less, of course. Remember that whole generosity thing that we talked about. So in the UK, for example, this might be £3,000. I know there are people that ask for £10,000 and people that ask for £50. But normal in the UK for middle class, let's say £3,000. If the amount is reasonable for the country and social class, but you still just simply can't afford it, then there are a few options. Number one is see what you have now and what you can reasonably save up over time and see if you can save up for that amount by the time you get married. Number two, you could split the mahar into two parts. This is called mu'ajjal and mu'akhar. Splitting it into what you give when you're actually getting married, when you're sitting down, you're signing the papers, etc. What you give then. And then there is the mu'akhar, which you can give later on. So you could give £1,500 now when you're actually getting married, but it says on the paper that you're going to give another £1,500 within a year or something like that. So that's a way of making it easy if you really can't afford it right now. And number three, and this is a funny one that a lot of people don't really say, is just to say, I can't afford it. Don't have any shame. Allah is the one that's written your is. If you can't afford it, you just can't afford it. And you can say that up front. And this is where men need to start being less compromising and just be real, confident and open. Don't be desperate. The reason a lot of people won't say I just can't afford it is social pressure and desperation to get married. And we need to shift away from realizing that we need to get married. I need married. And we need to realize that Allah is the one that will give you your money. And Allah is the one that will give you your wife. Now check this story out. When Ali was marrying Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet told him to give a gift, give her the mahar. He said, I have nothing. Okay, so we've got Ali here to back us up in just saying to the father of the girl you want to marry, I don't have anything. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, oh, you've got that shield. What about that shield? He said, uh, yeah, he gave the shield. Simple. So if you do that and you just say, I can't afford that amount, I'm not stingy, I'm not broke, I am making a living, I can provide for us, but that amount that you ask for is unreasonable and I just can't afford it. And when you say that, you leave the ball in their court. And a lot of the times this will actually work in your favor these days, because if you sat down with that girl, you are into her, she's into you, she will have emotional attachment than you will, and she's willing to compromise on it. And it's really up to them if they want to go ahead and decrease the amount they're asking for. In the end, it's not a payment. It's not something that determines her worth. It's really just a gift. And it is a gift that shows commitment, but the commitment is based on what you can actually afford. And now when you put the ball in their court, they can come back with some different things, which is going to be a good way of you judging them as well. If they will not compromise and they'll say something like, oh, go, go borrow money or no, we won't change it. That is a red flag anyway. And remember, the girl might be great and her parents might be the one pushing the mahar to go higher and it's not her. But remember, you're marrying into a family and you don't want to marry into a family with in-laws that have this kind of attitude. But then if they do compromise and they do reduce the mahar, then that's a really good sign that you're marrying into the right family with a good girl. But really, it's a red flag to be going into debt to give a gift. It's ridiculous and it's not something that is to be expected of us. And this is where your belief comes in. Yes, your belief in Allah. Would you do something haram, selling alcohol, selling insurance, selling banking services, whatever, for your income? Something that Allah has promised you and written for you. Would you do something haram, go into sin for that? Then also, don't go into debt. Don't make big compromises for a wife that inshallah Allah will provide for you. And trust me, if you say straight to the girl, to her father, to her mother, that I cannot afford this. I'm not stingy. I am able to provide. But that amount you asked, it's unreasonable. I just can't afford it. If you say that and they still say no, they might not accept you, but they will respect you. And that is a big deal for a young man. So that's how I would approach this whole mahar discussion. But if you're looking to get married, you know the biggest decision is who you actually marry. Check out these videos on screen now to find out what the best traits to look for in a wife are and also the traits you need to attract the best wife. Assalamu alaikum. See you around. See I could really break down Thinking about my past now Holding on to these roads Tied up in his ribs, gonna last